on your calendar. Today we put a lot of thought into what would be the scariest topic to discuss on Halloween. <laughs> <laughs> and I came up with Korea and nuclear weapons. So uh, it's my pleasure to introduce to you my friend and colleague Tom Preston. Tom is the C.O. Johnson Distinguished Professor of Political Science here at WSU. He also currently <coughs> serves as the director of, of our MA in Global Justice and Security Studies. Tom is a specialist in security policy, foreign affairs, and political psychology. He is uh, a faculty research associate at the Mo Moynihan Institute of Global Affairs at the Maxwell School at Syracuse University, and also at the National Center for Crisis Management, Research, and Training, which is part of the Swedish National Defense College in Stockholm. He is the author of numerous academic articles and three books, The President and His Inner Circle, Leadership Style, and the Advocacy Process in Foreign Affairs, published by Columbia University Press. Uh, a second book, From Lambs to Lions, Future Security Relationships in a World of Biological and Nuclear Weapons, published by Roman and Littlefield. And then uh, Pandora's Trap, Presidential Decision Making and Blame Avoidance in Vietnam and in Iraq, also published by Roman and Littlefield. Tom's current research projects include nuclear biological weapons prol proliferation, the effects of expertise and advisory groups on political leaders, and the uh, an exploration of the uh, psychology of bioterrorism. He is also frequently uh, serving as an independent consultant for various U.S. government agencies and departments. Join me now in welcoming Tom Preston. So is this a scary enough topic? <laughs> see a couple in costumes, that's great. Well, we're going to talk about the uh, North Korean nuclear crisis, and uh, you know how I want to approach this is, is basically to kind of bring about, talk about a couple of basic questions and kind of where we're going today. You know, firstly, there's a lot of hyperbole out in the press right now, and there's a lot of discussion about, oh, we have to do something about North Korea. I guess what I will be putting to you is, well, do we need to do that? Uh, and, and how serious indeed is the problem? How serious is the threat to the U.S. Uh, and to the region? Uh, you know, what are Pyongyang's actual nuclear capabilities and intentions? Under what conditions uh, might we expect North Korea to actually use nuclear weapons? And what are the views of the actors in the region? Also, you know, obviously we need to ask the question, is this a threat that can be dealt with politically or just militarily or maybe a combination of both? You know, is it feasible? You hear a lot of people talk about the idea of you know, using force, preempting the North Koreans. Is this really a feasible option or not? And what is the true rationale for the North Korean nuclear program? Uh, and, and if there are options on the political or economic side available, what might those be? Another question is, is Kim Jong-un really irrational or crazy or undeterrable? Because, you know, a lot of the argument for taking action against the North Koreans hinges on this notion that he is so undeterrable, he's so crazy, we can't dare allow the North Koreans to have nuclear weapons. Uh, so let's talk about that and also what might be the crisis implications, uh, because we are in a situation where uh, President Trump and Kim are both uh, kind of interacting with each other. What might be some of the downsides in a crisis of that combination? And what might be realistic approaches for the U.S. to take uh, regarding North Korea? <coughs> So let's start the conversation by actually over, doing an overview of the North Korean nuclear program. Um, there's been a lot of developments uh, as of late. Uh, there was a significant uh, nuclear breakthrough. Uh, the North Koreans, the most recent test uh, came out with 150 kiloton explosion. Now kiloton is 1,000 tons of TNT equivalent. Uh, that is quite significant, just by comparison, say, the bomb that was dropped on Hiroshima was somewhere in the neighborhood of 12 to 15 kilotons. So when you're talking about 150 kilotons, you're talking about something far more powerful than what was dropped on Hiroshima. Uh, now, despite the North Koreans' claims, because, uh, you know, they were always saying, oh, we, we dropped a hydrogen bomb, they, this is not a hydrogen bomb. A hydrogen bomb is much more powerful with yields that go up into the megatons or a million tons of TNT equivalent. This, is not, this was not a hydrogen bomb. This was a boosted fission bomb, uh, which is a more advanced uh, version uh, of, of the lower yield ones that were used in Hiroshima. Now, even though it wasn't a hydrogen bomb, I mean, I know they wanted to emphasize it was a hydrogen bomb for PR's sake, but that is still a significant breakthrough. A boosted fission weapon uh, brings yields from 50 to 150 kilotons. 
Uh, certainly, a 150 kiloton bomb would be a city buster type of bomb if you detonated in the air over someplace like Seoul. Uh, but one thing I, I would emphasize is that uh, just because you do a test doesn't mean you actually have a weapon that can be coupled to a warhead, to a, to a missile yet. And certainly if you're talking about uh, posing a threat to the United States, uh, just because you do a test does not mean uh, that you actually have done the miniaturization necessary on a warhead uh, to actually be able to, to put it on an ICBM. Uh, this is not a simple task, and I think a lot of times people underestimate how complicated it is to actually couple a warhead uh, to an ICBM and actually have it be able to survive. Uh, you know, you have to reduce the weight, so there's the miniaturization issue. There's all sorts of stresses and pressures that come into play when you re-enter the atmosphere. And to this date, there has not been a North Korean test that has demonstrated a re-entry vehicle, an RV, that, is pot that, that would be usable in this sense. So, uh, you know, it, it, I know the uh, Defense Intelligence Agency came out with that, that finding that, oh yes, there's been this miniaturization. Well, that is not the consensus finding in the intelligence community yet. Uh, and I think they're uh, quite overstating, overstating it, because it's quite a difficult task. Now, North Korea also possesses two different pathways to nuclear weapons. Uh, they possess a highly enriched uranium path, which is one that they've been working on sort of clandestinely for some time, and also a plutonium-based route, uh, which is mostly, uh, they're mostly acquiring that material from their own beyond reactor. Uh, now, the value, the, the reason why it's kind of significant is plutonium, smaller weights of it uh, will produce, a, you know, large explosions. So, you know, if you're actually trying to miniaturize warheads, if you're actually thinking about this eventually becoming a threat vis-a-vis uh, -vis ICBMs, uh, the plutonium ones uh, material is probably the one that would be most used for that because you have to use a much greater quantity of, of uranium, HU, to, to basically uh, do the same thing. Um, but, you know, that being said, I know that there's all this focus in the U.S. about, you know, whether a missile can hit the U.S. What we have to always bear in mind is that there are many regional targets that are already clearly within range of the North Koreans. Uh, they don't need an ICBM to hit Japan. They don't need an ICBM to hit South Korea. Uh, and, and certainly they are already within range of this arsenal. Um, and, you know, there has been some concern, and, and you know, and, and as, a, as a nuclear analyst, I, I, I share that concern with how rapid some of the progress has been uh, in the nuclear program. But a lot of these advances and what we've seen, you know, the higher yield warheads, the uh, move to solid fuel missiles rather than liquid fuel missiles, uh, likely <coughs> has been attributed not only to the indigenous development within North Korea, but also to the Khan network, which if you've heard of that, it was a black market network which sold, you know, actual designs of warheads, things like that. We know that the Khan network engaged with North Korea. There has been black market scientists that we know have worked on the missile program from Russia and other places. Uh, and we also know that there has been some cooperation uh, in technology with Iran, uh, with North Korea. So that contributes to the, the development uh, of their program and how fast it has developed. On the screen, you can see, here's a, just sort of a rundown of some of the facilities. These are the ones that we're aware of, and undoubtedly there's very, very many more that we are not aware of. But you know, as you can see from the map, uh, it is widely distributed, there is redundancy, and what is often misunderstood with people who are arguing for preemption and using military, you know, like airstrikes or something like that, is a lot of these facilities are hard and buried deep, deep in the ground, uh, in hard rock. Um, and we don't know where they're all at. Uh, you know, one of the things about the North Koreans is they've been tunneling like orcs in the mountains for decades, okay? And there are many places where they can hide, you know, rockets, other things, coming up through shafts with elevators with blast doors, opening up, firing, then shutting and going back down. So this is not an easy target to hit. Uh, and, and so that, that is something to bear in mind, that a lot of these things, you know, the Defense Intelligence Agency was talking about that they miniaturized, well, 10 years ago. DIA had acknowledged that these facilities were so deeply buried underground that they were virtually impregnable to airstrikes. So that's something that needs to 
be borne in mind when we talk about military options. Other aspects of the nuclear program. Now, you know, the, you know, the, thing, the other thing that has gotten a lot of press has been the missile tests. And it's important not to conflate the two because nuclear weapons, just because you know, that's just because you have a missile test doesn't mean you have a nuclear weapon to put on it. And, you know, the technologies are separate. Uh, but that being said, the recent missile tests have shown significant advances in distance, uh, up to 4,300 miles or longer for the longer-range missiles, which certainly puts Alaska and Hawaii within range. Uh, again, I would emphasize there's been no clear <coughs> tests of reentry technology, so even if you can fire something that far, um, the North Koreans have not demonstrated the ability to, you know, the distance you can fire a missile, you can fire an empty missile a lot further than you can if you have to put a warhead weight on top of it. The payload reduces range. And so this is something that, that you should uh, take into account. I think what you're seeing with this test is it would suggest that the North Koreans are advancing towards an ICBM capability. And I think it, is, it would be a reasonable estimate to suggest that within the next five years uh, they could have that capability. I am not convinced that these are ICBMs at current. I think these are intermediate range missiles uh, that are being tested at the moment. And usually the gap between a successful test and operational deployment of a missile tends to be about five years. Uh, here you can see the various missiles uh, and their ranges that the North Koreans uh, have and then, you know the, so here you're seeing the outer range of some of the limits uh, of the one that has been tested most recently. Um, and the main goal, you know, I mean, why are the North Koreans doing this? Um, well, the main goal, uh, you know, and and most North Korea watchers agree on this point is that. Basically, the main goal of the North Korean nuclear program is to establish clear nuclear deterrence capability uh, versus the U.S. and against regional actors. Uh, you know, and the North Koreans have long had this notion of wanting to deter attack. They're very concerned about efforts at regime change. They've watched what happened in Iraq. They've watched what happened in Libya. Uh, and they will refer to these incidents. Uh, as, as justifications for the program. And of course the North Koreans are very good at hyperbole themselves and they, they like to do, they, uh, they actually put this on, uh, some of you may have seen this, this is New York, uh, but they borrowed it from a Call of Duty game. Because, um, you know, so, you know, they're, 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 their production of this isn't as advanced as their missiles. Um, but uh, it is still, uh, it's an effort to create a psychology of deterrence. I mean, you threaten horrible things to make people back off. Right? Uh, so that certainly makes sense in that, in, in that way. Uh, I think the important thing is that uh, we should not overreact to the rhetoric of Kim Jong-un uh, because uh, Americans tend to take rhetoric very literally uh, and certainly when you talk about uh, you know, North Korea, uh, I mean, they, they have all this bombastic rhetoric all the time. If you, if you took it seriously, they would have bombed Seoul 30 years ago. Uh, so, and some of this is just showing strength and, and, and also trying to, to uh, impress upon the U.S. that they are, they are uh, serious and, 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 and would, would retaliate if they were attacked. Uh, but just because they're saying these aggressive things doesn't necessarily mean that they would use nuclear weapons against someone if they have them. In fact, they've had nuclear weapons since 2006, and they still haven't used them. Anymore. So, you know, you can't basically say just because they have them, they will use them. Uh, that doesn't quite work that way. Uh, North Korea has possessed substantial weapons of mass destruction capacity for <laughs> decades. Uh, I think that's also something that's often overlooked. Uh, the North Koreans have existing a large chemical weapons arsenal with nerve agents, sarin, all sorts of things like that. They also have a biological weapons program. Uh, so, you know, it is just not the nuclear side alone. And the North Koreans have, have extensive capability to fire chemical agents and nerve agents uh, like on Seoul and places like that if they wanted to. Uh, so, you know, they have possessed that sort of deterrence capability and you, know, you will have people make the argument sometimes that, well, you know, we can't let North Korea have WMD because they sell every WMD they would get. Well, they've had chemical and biological for decades and they haven't sold it to anybody. So the North Koreans certainly are behaving more as if they see this as a way to deter attacks upon themselves 
uh, and, and not as, as something to be used sort of uh, irrationally. Uh, also, it's important to note that North Korea has also possessed conventional deterrence on the peninsula for decades as well. I mean, the Pentagon has estimates come out with the, the reality that the North Koreans could fire about half a million shells an hour and rockets onto Seoul or anywhere along that border, and that we wouldn't be able to stop them. So there's a lot of collateral damage that they, they could inflict. Just even if you remove the WMD thing, uh, you know, I mean, the, 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 the casualties that could be created just with conventional weapons are quite staggering. If you've ever been to Seoul, you know that, I mean, I've flown over Seoul in a Blackhawk, and, you know, every, every part of the ground that could be built on is built on. You couldn't miss hitting something if you fire it. Um, and it's important to recognize half of the population of South Korea lives within 25 miles of the DMZ. That's closer than Lewiston. To you. Uh, all within range of the artillery. Uh, and rockets. Uh, the estimates that the Pentagon has if there was a new Korean War are one million casualties. And that may be understating it depending on where that type of conflict went. So when people just sort of suggest, oh, why don't we just attack North Korea or preempt them, you have to also bear in the back of your mind these numbers. Uh, this reality that they're, the North Koreans have a proven capacity to retaliate on this magnitude of a scale. Um, now, what sort of what sort of capabilities do the North Koreans now have? And that's kind of interesting because when I, I wrote the book Lambs to Lions back in 2007 and updated it a couple years later, um, and at the time North Korea was just a nascent early stage nuclear state with sort of limited local capabilities, uh, and 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 of course in the book I predict that they would develop more regional capabilities over time. And in fact, that is what they have done. Uh, and now you would have to consider North Korea not a nascent or early stage state that is easy to preempt, but one which is not very vulnerable to that sort of preemption, one which has redundant capabilities to use their arsenal. Uh, the estimates of how large the North Korean nuclear arsenal is at this point range from a low of, say, 25 warheads to a high of 60 or more <coughs> warheads. Uh, and those are usually developed based upon estimates of how much fissile material are available and how much it takes to build a weapon. Uh, but, you know, these, this would include both plutonium and highly enriched uranium weapons. Uh, one of the things that makes their arsenal more impressive now is that there is a lot, much more differentiation within their force structure. I mean, they, they are not limited to just one type of weapon, you know, like a primitive A-bomb, like, like a Hiroshima-type bomb. Uh, they have the fission weapons, which have higher yields. They also have boosted fission weapons, uh, which, which are much more destructive. Uh, so that has to be taken into account. And also, the composition range and accuracy of delivery systems. You know, not, not worrying about the ICBM thing. What the North Koreans currently have is an existing capacity of short and medium range delivery systems with missiles. Uh, that could easily strike all of South Korea, U.S. forces based in South Korea, bases in Japan. Uh, you know, this isn't a hypothetical like the ICBM is. This is actually capacity. Uh, and, you know, also what is often lost in all of the heavy breathing about missiles is that basic combat aircraft also have delivery capability. You can strap a bomb onto a fighter aircraft and use it as a delivery system. And the MiG-23-29s, the SU-25s that the North Koreans have are also capable of being a used as a delivery system. Uh, so, you know, there's more than one type of delivery, which if you think about it, you know, the way that you prevent being preempt is you have multiple ways of delivering things. Uh, you know, how interceptable is your attack? Well, most of the, no the new North Korean missile systems are road mobile. They are mobile missiles. And they are, they are based in hardened facilities. So not only are they hard to hit when they're in their base, but then you scatter and disperse them around. And the North Koreans are very adept at, at subterfuge, you know, decoy missiles, all sorts of things that would complicate our targeting. Uh, so, you know, the, the fact that you have multiple types of, of delivery systems and the delivery systems themselves are mobile uh, uh, makes preemptive attacks very difficult. 
the larger size of the current arsenal means there's redundancy. So even if you can hit quite a few of them, I mean, if you're in South Korea, uh, you can't exactly be sanguine about the idea of, well, we could we can maybe intercept 80% of their stuff before it could be launched. I mean, you, you're sitting there with 10 million people in Seoul. Uh, so, uh, and, and, and this move to solid fueled missiles increases penetration ability because solid fueled missiles launch faster, you know, they don't take as much prep time, and they, they, they are faster. So it complicates interception. So what does that mean in terms of targeting and employment options? And these are tables that I've just basically updated from Lambs to Lions to, to, to reflect current day North Korean capacity. Uh, but really, you know, the, the, the sort of the threat to the U.S., the global use, that's really extremely limited. The North Koreans do not have the ability to deliver here uh, unless you're using unconventional means of delivery. You know, if you hide something in a cargo container on a ship or a plane, you could still, you know, you could still hit the U.S. with that. You don't need an ICBM to hit the U.S. Uh, you could also do an EMP attack uh, in theory, which is... Electromagnetic pulse, if you, you know, one nuclear weapon fired about 70 miles up in the atmosphere could blank out all uh, communication and knock out power grids all along the west coast. And certainly if you did it over Korea, you could take out the whole area with the peninsula and, and probably parts of Japan too. But again, extremely limited. So I think people that are getting get hyperventilating over a threat to the U.S. really overstate this. The true threat that the North Koreans pose currently is regionally and locally. <coughs> Uh, you think about the in regional theater, uh, you certainly have uh, battlefield use, you know, certainly you could uh, target conventional forces, you know, attack, you know, bases, attack naval assets, ports, uh, command and control. Uh, you could certainly attack counter value or city targets, basically uh, hold, hold the city populations of your neighbor hostage. Uh, that's certainly a possibility. You could target critical economic infrastructure. Uh, you know, anything, you know, basically the, the logic of deterrence is, you know, I just have to threaten you with pain that you don't want to accept. So if I can destroy something that you value more than any sort of gain you could get, well, I'm probably going to deter you. So that's why you can talk about counter force targets, you know, military targets, or city targets. Uh, EMP attacks would be possible there. Leadership uh, decapitation. You know, the North Koreans hacked and stole a lot of the war plans, unfortunately. Uh, uh, recently that the South Koreans were holding, but of course, you know, the North Koreans could do their own decapitation attack on Seoul with a, with a nuclear weapon in theory. And of course, locally, uh, you know, target conventional forces, I mean, you could imagine the North Koreans using tactical nuclear weapons to, to uh, hold back a U.S. invasion of the North, uh, a lot of where, or, you know, you could even just do a demonstration or a warning shot. And this is something where you're not actually killing anybody, but maybe if a crisis got to a certain point, I could, I could imagine the North Koreans detonating a bomb up in the air or detonating something out as a, as a warning. That, you know, if you cross this line any further, this is where this will go. Uh, so as you can see, the, the current, you know, those capabilities that I was describing in the previous slide actually lead to a lot of employment options and targeting options for the North Koreans. And if you think that this is not really that significant. Here's a table that just illustrates, and these are just using, you know, just a couple, this is like, if you take the lowest estimate, that's less than half of the lowest estimate of their arsenal. And, you know, if you were just using, even if you were using 15, 20 kiloton bombs like Hiroshima, look at, look at the population of these cities you could hold at risk that are within 30 miles of the border and within range of these systems. I mean, literally, you're looking at 16 million people you're holding at risk as a counter value target. That's, uh, that's, that's maybe a little more sobering than people getting up on Fox News and pounding their chests and saying, oh, we can, we can take them. Uh, because these are, these are capa capabilities, and certainly, if the North Koreans have a much larger arsenal, you can imagine that you know, this could be, I, the table could be much scarier. Uh, Here's an estimate, and this is a very conservative estimate. Uh, I just kind of extrapolated it from uh, Lambs to Lions, and uh, you know, here's where we're at in 2017. Uh, and actually, the number I, numbers I came up with, and that's just estimating Yongbyon's production of plutonium, and sort of con some conservatively estimated amounts that might be coming from clandestine production. That gets you right about that 60 number that DIA had. But you can also see where this goes. 
and you know, in a few years you're, you're talking about a much larger arsenal. Uh, and in all likelihood, uh, that is seriously underestimating the uh, highly enriched uranium uh, production uh, that's being done in other places. But uh, you can see the numbers of warheads that that results in. By 2025, at least 87. Uh, you know. Okay. Now, one of the things I would say about this is that um, there are some political options, and, and there was there was issues. Uh, one of the things that, that happened, we, we had something called the Agreed Framework back in 1994 where we engaged in a negotiation with the North Koreans to freeze their nuclear program. Now, although you know it's probably likely that they were cheating on some of the uranium enrichment side, they did completely shut down the plutonium stuff at Yongbyon. There were inspections uh, and, and they, they were not doing nuclear tests. So between 1994 and 2003, the North Koreans actually abided by the agreed framework. Uh, and it prevented plutonium production, which is the one we were kind of concerned about. Uh, you know, what happened in 2003 was basically we had the axis of evil speech uh, and the Bush administration uh, basically reneged on a lot of the agreements in the agreed framework. It's a little bit echoes here of the Iran deal because basically we stopped abiding by some of the aspects of the agreed framework. We wanted to renegotiate the agreed framework, just like we want to renegotiate the Iran deal. The North Koreans said no. Uh, they basically then pulled out of the agreement uh, and then tested their first nuclear weapon in 2006. It is estimated, if you think these numbers are bad here, it is estimated that had the agreed framework not been uh, entered into, the North Koreans would now possess enough material for over 200 weapons, not, you know, 60. Uh, so, you know, it did make a difference, but it also illustrates the fact that there are some possibilities uh, for diplomacy. Uh, again, let's talk a little bit about the, you know, what the ambitions of everybody uh, involved is. North Korea, I would certainly argue that their primary focus is to prevent regime change, you know, to, to ensure regime survival. Uh, establishment of a nuclear deterrence with the U.S. and others. Uh, certainly, the symbolic demonstration of this nuclear program has become a source of nationalism and pride within North Korea, helps reinforce the rule of Kim Jong-un, uh, and, and increase support by certain elites uh, in him. And, and certainly, it establishes regional power status to advance North Korean interests. Uh, there is, you know, down, you know, way down the road, the idea of some sort of reunification well, from the North Korean perspective, they would like to see it on their terms, not on South Korea's terms. Uh, but one of the important aspects of North Korea has always been Juche, which is self-sufficiency. This was true uh, from Kim Il-sung on, from the grandfather to the father to Kim Jong-un. Uh, and that, that self-sufficiency is in terms not only in economics, but also in security. And nuclear weapons plays into this Juche. I, I, I would argue it sort of creates a security Juche for North Korea. Uh, in terms of China, uh, it, you know, China's main interest in the region is certainly to expand Chinese military power and influence in the region, uh, certainly to, uh, to push their claims to uh, disputed waters in the South China Seas down here and, and some of the islands off of Japan, uh, certainly to build economic dominance. Uh, and from the Chinese perspective, this requires us to preserve the existing regional status quo. Uh, with the North Korean regime. Uh, the last thing the Chinese want to do, I mean, everyone's always saying, well, why don't, they, why don't the Chinese just force the North Koreans to, to cave in? Well, the North Koreans don't want a unified Korea as a U.S. ally sitting on their border. Uh, they don't want, uh, you know, a, a, a increased U.S. Uh, power in that area. Uh, so that is not certainly not something that the Chinese are remotely interested in doing. And so it is unrealistic to expect the Chinese to totally uh, cut off all oil and all sorts of things to the North Koreans because they, they don't want the refugees flooding into China as well if there was a collapse. And if you have a collapse with a nuclear-armed state, that's always a little scary. You don't know what's going to happen. If you're worried about black market arms, well, here's a good way to get black market arms when you have a nuclear state collapse. Uh, ideally, from the Chinese perspective, Anything that was done here on the peninsula should involve, you know, whole, ideally a secure North Korea that isn't antagonizing its neighbors. So, I mean, China's mad at North Korea. They don't 
want the missile deployment, you know, the THAAD, you know, the anti-missile systems being deployed in South Korea. They don't want to provoke the South Koreans or the Japanese to go nuclear. I mean, so, you know, the Chinese do have an interest, and that gives us a diplomatic opening to engage with China, but we have to be realistic about what we can expect the Chinese to go along with uh, in, in dealing with, with Korea. Uh, South Korea, I mean, clearly would like to build better, you know, maintain their security, but they, they are interested in building a better relationship with the North. Uh, they would like to push for denuclearization. Uh, the new government that replaced the Park government recently is much more interested in trying to <coughs> negotiate with the North, which I think is going to make a more bellicose U.S. policy far more difficult because you can't exactly pursue some of these aggressive sort of military options with the North Koreans if you're leaving your allies behind, particularly the South Koreans. Um, so, you know, certainly they would like to preserve that relationship, build economic ties with the U.S. and in the region, uh, but, but they do not really support sort of aggressive steps towards the North. The United Nations has been trying to use sanctions and resolutions to push for denuclearization and put limits on the North Korean uh, missile program, but of course you have to take into account uh, the Chinese and the Russians have veto in the UN, so realistically you shouldn't expect uh, too much there. Japan uh, has a much more nationalist government at this point with, uh, with <laughs> Prime Minister Abe. Uh, and Japan's main focus has been to maintain its own security vis-a-vis uh, -vis North Korea and China, uh, because I think the, the, China, the Japanese are, are equally concerned about China and, and the growth of Chinese power in the region, and certainly the aggressive nature of the Chinese territorial claims to islands. Uh, and, and they are certainly willing to uh, uh, look at, at uh, missile defense and things like that. So I think you know, you're, seeing, you're seeing one of the first reactions to the North Korean nuclear program, but I would argue also in the Chinese military buildup in Abe, now that he has a new majority uh, in, the, in the diet, he's going to push for redoing the Japanese constitution to allow the Japanese to use their military forces in, in other ways because there was a prohibition against use of you know, war. Um, it's a long ways before Japan decides to go nuclear, uh, but, but I think that this is the, the first step in that route. The U.S., uh, you know, obviously our primary focus should be protecting U.S. territories and regional allies uh, from, a, from a threat. Um, use sanctions, resolutions, um, solidify our strategic relationship with China, which is currently in serious decline uh, because of current policy. Uh, but one of the problems with the, the U.S. position is it's a little bit schizophrenic at the moment and it's very inconsistent. And some of the rhetoric that comes out of whether it be the White House or other places that talk about regime change and make some of the comments like that are extremely unhelpful uh, if you're thinking about trying to move towards a diplomatic solution. Um, is Kim Jong-un crazy or irrational or undeterrable? Uh, I, would, I would argue this is a mischaracterization of Kim. Uh, it's quite common among U.S. political leaders and in the press. Uh, and, and I would point out to you that it's exactly the same language you used to use about his dad. Uh, a lot, there's, there's a whole bunch of these, oh, yeah, well, you know, his dad ran over people in the car, and now Kim Jong-un feeds his uncle the dogs and shoots people with anti-aircraft guns. I and mean, all sorts of crazy stuff gets said. How much of it is true and how much of it is hyperbole, one doesn't know, but... Uh, very unlikely that, that a lot of this is true. A lot of this stuff is leaked uh, out of South Korean intelligence and stuff into the media, and it kind of gets a life of its own. Um, we do have a tendency to describe any actors we dislike or oppose as unstable or crazy, because, well, if they're not like us, they must be crazy, right? And so we've described Saddam that way, we've described the Kims that way, we've described the Iranian leadership that way, we've described... Kim Jong-un is not crazy. He is eccentric and mercurial, and he's probably not somebody you want to invite over for dinner, you know. But that doesn't mean that he's insane or crazy or irrational. The lead analyst on North Korea, CIA, just in the last three weeks, publicly stated that Kim Jong-un is not judged to be either irrational or crazy. And that those who have met Kim over the years share this view of him, that he actually is fairly predictable and behaves rationally if you understand his context. Uh, and there is no reporting. Uh, that suggests he is irrational, suicidal, or undeterrable. If anything, he and his father before him were obsessed with regime survival. That is still the main thrust uh, in protecting their regime from being overthrown. They want to survive. Uh, that's the whole reason 
for the nuclear program. <coughs> so if, if, if the rationale is for survival and you're not suicidal, <coughs> then you need to take into account, I, always, I tell my s national security students, some of whom are here, that you shouldn't do threat assessments based purely on capability. That's bad, that's sloppy analysis. You have to do threat assessments based on motivations and capability. Well, here's the motivations. Just because somebody has the capability, there's lots of states that have, Britain has the capability to nuke the U.S., but you don't <laughs> worry about that. Right? So, you know, you can't, you can't just focus purely upon uh, capability. Being ruthless and vicious and a Machiavellian dictator is not nice, but it doesn't make you crazy. Uh, and as we kind of move into the current crisis, uh, you, know, we, you know, what is the combustible mixture? And I've previously uh, spoken in this forum uh, on uh, President Trump's leadership style and personality. The problem here with, with, with Kim Jong-un and Trump is that you know, neither of them are crazy, but they're both narcissistic. They're both low complexity. They see the world very black and white, absolute terms. Uh, and they all both place a premium on saving face. So if both of them want to win and push the other one into losing, that's going to be difficult. That's going to inflame a crisis. That's a bad combination here. Uh, you know, and, and basically with low complexity leaders, they tend to have very closed advisory systems. They tend to seek advice from only like-minded people. Uh, they gather information that just supports their pre-existing views. They're largely insensitive to external constraints on their policy making. In other words, their antennae are not up. Their antennae are down. They are not monitoring the environment. And this is quite dangerous in crisis situations because you a lot of times will underestimate the dangers, you will underestimate the challenges of accomplishing something, uh, and you'll miss the potholes in the road because you're not gathering all the information that's available. When you have two leaderships with the same sort of characteristic, uh, you can imagine how it would make uh, you know, signaling difficult, but, but imagine if you, start, if you start having a crisis break out, de-escalation would be very difficult in that sort of a, a context. Uh, so, and, and, and it, is, it is clear that both are quite uh, notoriously prickly to perceive slights or insults, well known for lashing out against opponents. It is a dangerous combination uh, when you talk about this. So, just to kind of wrap up so that we've got some time for some questions, um, you know, is it realistic, you know, as we, as we kind of push our chair back and think about how, how should we approach this policy was. Is it realistic to, to expect North Korea to give up its nuclear weapons? I would argue it's not. Uh, the North Koreans are never going to give up those nuclear <laughs> weapons uh, voluntarily. Uh, and not unless there's a major sea change on a whole bunch of other things. Is it realistic to militarily interdict and eliminate the North Korean program through the use of force without sparking a massive conflict and casualties? And I would argue that it's absolutely not. And I have never heard anybody at Pentagon say something different. And they have war gamed this out and war gamed this out. And the degree of destruction and casualties is, is, is just, and that's why there's been conventional deterrence on the peninsula for 50 or 60 years. Uh, is it possible to imagine a stabilization of the status quo whereby the North would freeze its program in return for maybe recognition, formal end of the conflict, end of sanctions, a number of other things we could talk about diplomatically and economically, and I think potentially there is a possibility here. I think there is a potential to bring China and others in if we approach this in the correct way. Uh, but if we approach this as, you know, we will negotiate with you, but you have to totally capitulate and surrender to us and give us everything we want in exchange for nothing, which has been our negotiating position during the Bush administration, was pretty much, it wasn't a whole lot better during Obama, and certainly you know, is that way now, you're not going to get anywhere in the you might as well just you know, save yourself for breath. Uh, is any of these steps likely to lead immediately to the denuclearization of the peninsula in the near term? I, I don't think so. Uh, and is it likely that the West will have to adapt to a new security reality vis-a-vis -vis the North that is not ideal? And I would argue yes. And certainly the argument I make in my Lance to Lions book is that, look, you know, as states gain nuclear capabilities, they gain increasing abilities to deliver systems and and, and, and deliver them in a way that can't be interdicted. This changes the nature of the security relationship. It changes the rules of the game. And, and you, you are not able to just kind of, you, you end up falling into a deterrence relationship with opponents where you don't have the freedom of action uh, that, that you might have had in the, in the days when you didn't have uh, the nuclear weapons uh, in, in the picture. 
So I, mean, I think that is inevitable. I, I don't say. I mean, I think that the change I've seen just since my book came out to now, we're we're already past the point of no return on on that on the North Korean issue. Uh, that you know we we're going to have to accept some different rules of the game. That doesn't mean we can't negotiate and try to make a situation better and reduce tensions and uh, et cetera. And, and you know, if we accept the logic that the North Korean program is primarily there to preserve the regime and it's because of their insecurity. And I, I can tell you, I was, when, I, when I was in uh, Korea, uh, tailing the Clinton administration on a delegation from DOD over there, um, you know, and this was at a time when Secretary Albright had just made the trip to Pyongyang. Two weeks earlier, we were getting briefed on it in Seoul. And then, uh, you know, we, there was all sorts of negotiations, missile talks, and all sorts of things going on with the North Koreans, many of which isn't clear, it isn't public yet. Uh, but the, uh, the, the North Koreans were paranoid even then, during the height of Kim Dae-jung's sunshine policy, where there was all these openings to the north, and they were, they were building these economic zones, and they were opening railroads through the DMZ. If the North Koreans were paranoid then and distrustful, you can imagine that it's going to take quite a, uh, an effort at confidence building measures on our part and our allies' part to actually uh, break through sort of the, the sort of the situation now with the rhetoric and, and the things that have happened since since that time period. So why don't I just stop at that point? Okay. <laughs> About uh, 15 minutes for Q&A, maybe I'll start. You've done a good job scaring all of us on Halloween, I think. Yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> So let me ask you a question about Donald Trump and all the rhetoric about the uh, military option, not just from him, but also sometimes from the Pentagon here yeah. now. What is the strategy behind that, given the reality of a military strike? I, I, think, I think a lot of it, particularly when you think about somebody like Mattis, who has made some statements. And, and, and he is a lot more specific in his statement. He was, and when, when Mattis makes these sorts of, of threats about using force against the North Koreans, he's always, he's always putting it in the context of, if you attack us, if you attack the South Koreans, we will retaliate. So don't, don't be confused about that. So uh, I think you see you know, very different sort of, I mean, it's, it's a much more consistent with U.S. policy. I mean, that's been our policy. You know, it's just we haven't needed to be you know, shouting it that much in recent years, but it's always been our policy to retaliate if North Koreans attack. Uh, and I think Mattis was just trying to you know, be consistent, not, not put his head too far above the trench line within the Trump administration, but also trying to reassure allies that it's not just as well we're we're going to attack you based on rhetoric which is kind of how it's, it's Trump's Trump's rhetoric was interpreted if you keep talking this way we will take action or something yeah, like do that. Do you think Trump's committed to that policy or not? I don't know. I don't know. I don't want to I, I, I can't predict what, what is in his head. I, I just know that Mattis and McMaster and others were walking that comment back almost immediately. Uh, but then Trump continues to say things like that. So uh, and, and certainly, I don't. I, I think I think that there is there is a there's an effort to just have you know they want to have that strong political rhetoric for political reasons here domestically to be talking about. Uh, but you know I, th I think what you saw in Mattis's trip to South Korea was an effort to reassure Seoul uh, that we weren't going to do something reckless. Now the president's going to be visiting Asia this next week, so we'll see if that gets undone. <laughs> but. <laughs> Hey, Tom, thanks so much for um, giving us so much useful information. And I don't think, I, I think actually you assuage some of our fears. So really thanks for taking the time out and, and doing this expert analysis. I had a question for you from a policy perspective. Mm -hmm. So obviously um, we saw there was a window, a Kingdonian policy window that had opened up under the Clinton administration that created a situation where you could have this slowdown. And then since then, I mean, you talk about the Bush administration, but this was also under the Obama administration. So my big question is, what will it take? Because obviously the factors uh, opening that policy window are very complex. And it's quite clear it's not a left and right president thing, right? So I'm just curious from your perspective, uh, because it seems like that there's still a possibility to slow this thing down. And uh, not obviously not denuclearization, but perhaps getting back to the mid-1990s. So I'm just wondering what the, 
what the sort of expert view is on that. Is well, that I mean, possible? Korea, I mean, it's possible. I mean, Korea is not an easy policy problem. I mean, it's, it's a wicked problem. Uh, but, you know, I, I think there was that, I think you're correct, there was that, that golden opportunity in the 90s. Uh, the Kim Dae Jung were doing the sunshine policies. Um, and, and, and there was a lot of movement. And in fact, it, it did stop a big section of the North Korean program for a long time. Uh, the Bush administration came in and sort of immediately cut everything that was being done because if Clinton had done it, it must be bad. And it was, it was ironic because, I mean, I had some really good Republican friends that were Pentagon and elsewhere that I'd been on the delegation with. And we'd get together in the years following that and just go, why did they throw that? Why did they flush that away? You know, I mean, because you, know, you can be tough with North Korea on policy. You don't have to purposely undermine stuff. Um, so, and, and, and it, it did lead to a nuclear North Korea. That policy, that, that, that undiplomatic policy, I would argue, is what actually contributed to a nuclear North Korea, uh, as much as them having the materials, because um, it required their motive, motivation to get weapons. Uh, I think that there are possibilities. I think China would be willing to negotiate. I think, I think sometimes a uh, crisis can get turned up a bit, and maybe the heat rises enough under the, under the pot that it actually makes people become more serious and, and maybe gets some other countries to buy into a need to do something about it. I think that's true with Japan. I think it's true with South Korea. I think it's true with China. But it would require leadership on our part, and at the moment we don't really have a functioning State Department. We don't really... You know, I, so I'm kind of holding my breath to see what happens on this trip, in all honesty. Uh, because I could see the situation getting bad very quickly. Uh, and, uh, but, but yeah, I mean, I think there are possibilities, but we, we've kind of, I mean, when you're dealing with an opponent which is paranoid about you to begin with, if you spend years ratcheting up the stress, then it's kind of hard. Imagine how much diff more difficult the confidence building measures have to be uh, to, to, to undo some of that. So, yeah. Yeah, I'm a bit of a question here. I don't regard the Korean War as anything but a continuum of when I entered the draft. Mm -hmm. And I recall a man by Ben MacArthur. Yeah, under MacArthur's time, mm -hmm. we threatened North Korea with an atomic bomb attack. And I say to myself, okay, if you want to recognize that this is a monarchy, it's, call it what you want. <laughs> but these people don't forget easy, easily. They have good education systems, comparatively maybe not as good as ours. And what we're looking at is now the shoe is on the other foot. They are armed with and can do collateral damage to them, tremendous magnitude. Because I remember MacArthur marching down the street mm -hmm. on his presidential election. He wanted to run for president. Well, it's interesting with North Korea. I mean, the, I mean a lot of people don't realize that we're still sort of, it's, it's just a ceasefire. I mean, it's still a UN operation. That was a UN peacekeeping operation, peacemaking operation. Uh, I mean, it's still, I mean, the commander in, uh, is still in Unksink, a UN Supreme Commander that commands U.S. and South Korean forces. So, yeah, I mean, it's one of the, one of the angles to, um, and certainly one of the things the North Koreans have always brought up when there have been negotiations was, we want a peace treaty, we want a formal uh, declaration of end of hostility, we want diplomatic recognition, you know, diplomatic, full diplomatic relations with the U.S., uh, you know, dropping the economic saying all of these things. So for the North Koreans, um, I, I think you know they, they still see it in, in somewhat similar ways. Yeah, this is still a war. This is still a conflict, uh, and and they you know if, if they have the attitude that if we truly want to move beyond that point where they are no longer threatened, then then we should be taking those sorts of steps. Maybe uh, they are always asking us to stop doing the. The joint military drills with the South Koreans that we do every every year, um, you know, maybe pull back forces or whatever. And I think some of these things, you know, I, I think those are all potential carrots that we could have during talks if we were really serious with the North Koreans. 
but there's you know some of these are you can play the card one time like diplomatic relations and like that. I think those should be held for some concessions on their side, but we have to be realistic about the concessions that we can ask for. And as you point out, I mean now that they have nuclear weapons and can inflict not harm on us necessarily here in the U.S., but certainly enough harm on our allies that should give us pause. Uh, that we have to negotiate with them in a slightly different way than we might have in the past. So, yeah. So yeah. So as a follow-up to that. Um, you know, what worked in China back in the Nixon administration was to open up trade, <coughs> initiate ping pong diplomacy, mm -hmm. so we could send Dennis Rodman over there to play some more basketball. And uh, maybe invite. Uh, I think we should send Michael Jordan this time. Well, you know, Dennis can bring Michael. They were teammates. So, uh, uh, but, but we know no. he won't target Chicago at least. Yeah, this <laughs> <true>. <laughs> yeah that, that would be very good. But at any rate, but no, I mean, I mean, we have a blueprint that actually worked quite well. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, we, we have tremendous trade with China at this point, and there's so much, we're so much in debt to them, they would never do anything to us, so they would collapse their economy. Autocratic regimes, the last thing they tend to like is uh, increasing contact and free movement of people and economic contacts. And one could argue that one reason Castro remained in power for all these decades was because of U.S. policy. Uh, and that, you know, and so, I mean, the North Koreans are, you know, you can only have radios that have two stations on them. I mean, they're built that way because they don't want you getting outside information. You know? So, um, yeah, I mean, if, if you could, I mean, that was the idea behind Kim Dae-jung's sunshine policy, the South Korean leader who started saying, let's do these joint economic zones in the South. South Korean companies were investing uh, there, and, and, and there, you know, there had been some rollback of this because of some of the testing, and this is but that could be restarted. Uh, there were openings, you know, like, you know, openings to, to have roads and railroads uh, going across the DMZ to, to improve some connections. Families that had been separated by the war were allowed to go across. You know, I actually uh, was there and observed some of the demining operations and stuff that were going through the DMZ when they were doing that. Uh, you know, so there's all sorts of things where, yeah, you could build those, those ties, and, and I think what, what is often not picked up by U.S. observers is that not just Kim, uh, Kim Jong-un, but Kim Jong-il too, the father, actually was more interested in doing economic reform and had actually traveled to China, to Shanghai and other places and had brought some of the Chinese economic models to North Korea. So they have been reforming or trying to reformulate their economy. And in fact, the North Korean economy, even with sanctions, was growing at 4%. Uh, so, you know, I mean, I think there there are these ways that you can, you know, maybe moderate the regime over time. Um, you know, it's it's sort of the, one of those things. I mean, it is, whether you're talking about Iran, whether you're talking about North Korea, whether you're talking about a lot of these countries, I think Americans are too impatient with their policy, and they 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 they, they plant a little fruit tree and they expect a bumper harvest immediately. Uh, and I think you know the, the best way to approach this is over time to moderate the behavior of the regime through engagement of things and, and keeping the pot the, the fire under the pot turned down so that you don't have a crisis and over time you you want to to change the nature of the relationships and I think that is the way forward on some of these things certainly when a military option is not viable I mean George Marshall who is one of my heroes once said political problems viewed in military terms become military problems. And, and that was true in Vietnam, and it was true in other things. And, and this, is, this is quintessentially a political problem. And, and whether we choose to turn it into a military problem is really kind of up to us. But, but it at its heart is a political problem that should be dealt with in that way. You know, deterring a bad, a bad behavior, but... Yeah. It, it seems to me that, the, uh, that we would need the leadership that would take us into turning the pot down and either we are going to have to get through the next four years or, or somebody is going to have to bring us grounds for impeachment. <laughs> I think I think it's difficult to imagine the current administration doing this. Yeah. Uh, I'll be honest. Uh, I think I think Kim Jong un is probably in a I think three years ago he wouldn't have been willing to engage. I think Kim Jong un is has solidified his hold on power in North Korea to the point where he might have the confidence to engage 
if you thought that it was a trustworthy. But I mean, I, I think you know, there's there, these things are not in a vacuum. North Korea policy isn't in a vacuum either. If we, for example, walk away from the Iran deal and we want to renegotiate it after we sign it, the North Koreans have already said, why should we ever sign an agreement with the U.S. Because you know, you'll walk away from it. We can't take you at your word. You know, it puts us. It's kind of ironic for us to be put in that position. And we've also walked away from that environmental protection right. leadership of the world. So, so there, we got time for another one. You got time for one more question? So, considering the increasing likelihood of escalation between North Korea and South Korea and U.S. etc. What sort of effects would you expect that to have on the relationship between North Korea and China? Hmm. Well, I mean, I think you see China putting a lot of pressure on North Korea to calm down. I mean, the, the, the Chinese were furious uh, when the North Koreans did this latest nuclear test, and they were not happy with the missile test either. Um, I don't think the Chinese, I mean, yeah, in a perfect world, you know, you don't want them to have those things, but the Chinese are willing to accept that, well, if we don't live in a perfect world, this is what we got. Uh, I think the Chinese just do not want the North Korean behavior to, you know, reinforce U.S. presence in the region because states are wanting to have more of our assets over there, military assets over there, or, you know, encourage some of these states to build up their own nuclear arsenals or things like that, which in a way compromise China's. Uh, you know, missile defense systems like the THAAD, which, you know, would deploy in South Korea or China or Japan, they have capacity against Chinese weapons too. So it's not, you know, so they're not happy about that behavior. I, I don't think that, I don't think that North Korea is going to purposely cause a conflict with South Korea or Japan. I think the real, I think if, if you were to ask what I thought was the biggest danger right now, it would it would have to be a crisis that escalated because of rhetoric and because of, you know, steps, you know, each side making some provocative steps, either with their forces, you know, flying bombers too close to border, whatever, and, and neither side willing to give the other an avenue for saving face. And I can see that sort of thing creating a sort of a spiral conflict, you know. And I think that's, if I was to put my, my finger on the one aspect that I'm most concerned about, that's what I'm concerned about. Um, I don't think either side would rationally calculate that this is a good thing, but a lot of wars have started inadvertently from miscalculation and from people escalating a conflict and not being able to, to negotiate it. And we don't exactly have great ability to have conversations with the North Koreans directly. So. Okay, let me remind you, if you're here for a class, there'll be some sign-up sheets out in the outer lobby, so uh, you should go out there. Uh, I want to thank you all for coming out on Halloween and join me now and thank you for the <coughs>